Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast, a podcast for people who want to learn more about their personal finances and get the most from their money. This series is hosted by Kate Campbell from How To Money and Owen Raskovich from Rask Finance. The Australian Finance Podcast is provided for educational purposes only. The information is general in nature and does not take into account your needs, goals or objectives. What that means is the information does not apply to you specifically. So consider getting the advice of a licensed and trusted professional before acting on the information. Ted, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Owen. Thanks, Kate. It's uh, it's uh, our privilege to have you here. You're a former AFL superstar. You got your own podcast. You're working at Six Park. You've well, done it all, mate. Oh uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that at all. I've very much proud and enjoy my time that I played football, but I always knew what I wanted to move into after football, and that's investing. So um, thoroughly enjoy what I do, and um, I started up the podcast a few years ago as a bit of a, a trial and. Uh, pleasingly, it, it seems to have got a few listeners. So, um, yeah, that's very much what I'm up to now. Great. Yeah, I know Kate is a fan of Six Park. Is yes. That correct? Yeah, I've been uh, using Six Park myself for a couple of years now. So, I've been reading Ted's blogs and podcasts, uh, watching, reading, listening to the podcast since. So, so, that's been really good. And I've I've enjoyed my journey with Six Park. Oh, it's, it's good to hear. We've just had our third birthday. Mm. And, um, uh, robot, we're a robo advisor, which I probably already lost many people that may go, <laughs> what, what's, what's a robo advisor? And, and all it means is we provide investment management online. And um, it's a bit different because we don't provide it face to face. And um, so we now have clients all over Australia, mm. like yourself, Kate. And um, we've got a lot of people that sign up to our newsletter. And um, I'm thoroughly enjoying it to be able to um, I don't know, help people. Um, improve the quality of life for the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. It's, mm. it's a thoroughly rewarding career. Mm. I think it's great nowadays you can get a whole portfolio set up without actually having to see anyone face-to-face. I know especially I probably I wouldn't have time or I don't really want to see someone face-to-face, so it's great to have that option nowadays. Mm. Um, before we get stuck in, I'm going to jump in and yeah. because I, I would like to, and I think our listeners would benefit from this, is just learning more about you. Uh, you said it's finance investing has been a passion for you for a long time. How about you just give, give us the, the, the quicker version of, of your history, um, particularly growing up, was money a part of your life, uh, was finance, anyone mentor you, anything like that? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Melbourne and um, always had a deep passion for AFL and I <laughs> uh, was fortunate enough to get drafted at the age of 17 and, um, you know, very lucky in that when you get drafted, uh, you get paid, and uh, um, <laughs> suddenly uh, you've got lots of money. You know, at I, I, yeah, well, I, suddenly you know I'm, I'm living with mum and dad, and, and and you know 17, 18, and coming into a bit of money, and mm. having to you know, make decisions about what I'm going to do with it now that I'm a, a young adult. Mm. And um, my dad gave me a book at the time, as Peter Lynch's book, One Up on Wall Street, and um, I didn't do any accounting, economic subjects at um, at school. And I really enjoyed it. Um, and I decided that I was going to start investing in the market off the back of what I was reading by Peter Lynch. And I made some pretty expensive lessons in that <laughs> um, I was pro- probably thought I was a bit better than I was and probably a bit naive and had, had too much confidence for and probably not an appreciation of what actual real research is. But um, what it did do is plant the seed in my mind about it. Um, another passion that I had and that is investing so started to read as much as I could started a commerce degree and um, very proud to say that I had a football career that was went for 16 years um, and but I've studied for 15 of those and um, so knocked over the commerce degree and the master's and um, I also worked part-time so for six years uh, albeit just one day a week um, in the, in, in the investing space for two years on the sell side under stockbrokers, mm-hmm. just learning a bit about mm. that. And that's over the sell side. And um, I, I quite enjoyed that, but also wanted to get a bit, dig a bit deeper over the, the buy side. So I had four years over there working under a fund manager. And um, when my football wrapped up, uh, my football career finished up in 2016, um, I, I knew that the, the, the next career, the new challenge that I wanted to take up and 
Um, I had a friend in Singapore that knew about um, someone that was starting up a, a fund in Australia called Six Park, and I knew very little about robo advice. And uh, Pat, who's the CEO of Six Park, and I sat down for a coffee, and he started talking about um, what's going on with robo advice around the world, and it really resonated with me because I have seen so many people in my life um, fall victim to poor advice, whether it's lack of transparency, too high a fees, so many conflicts, all these things have probably come mm. out about the Royal Commission over the last you know, six months. And, and I'd seen teammates in the, in the change rooms of the football club fall victim to this too. And so I... I wanted to get involved and uh, so I uh, moved down from Sydney to Melbourne to join Six Park and um, that's been there for over over two years now and hmm. thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> cool. Did you, so did you grow up in Melbourne? Yeah, I grew up in Melbourne. I went to school around the corner from here too. Oh, <laughs> nice <laughs> and close. Yeah. Yeah. To talk into the terms of the topic of behavioural economics, which I know you went overseas to study, was it at Harvard? Yeah, I um, did a course at Harvard Business School last year. Yeah, I saw you had done that and I didn't even know they offered that sort of stuff. So that's really cool. Um, so what? how did you come across the topic of behavioral economics and what interests you about it? Yeah, so I, I studied economics in the commerce degree and, and my master's of applied finance and, and listeners may be aware, but the, the study of economics assumes that we're all rational and that we always make decisions that are in our best interest. Um but that's not that's not actually <laughs> no, I don't the case. Think that's no, the case. No, no. <laughs> um, um, so we're not rational, and not only that, we make predictable mistakes time and time again. And mm. I, I'm not saying that other people do this, and I'm I'm perfect. I put myself in this category too. So the study of behavioural economics is it, it is aware that we're we're not always rational, and, mm. and some of the decisions we make are influenced by biases. And so. Um, I wanted to do that because I'd started at Six Park and I'd be speaking with clients and partners and different people within the industry about logical reasons, and which are really important about mm. asset allocation, keeping your fees low, diversifying, and all these fantastic important things. But this, but people, and once again, I put myself in this category, would, would be so influenced by something they saw in a newspaper a week mm. ago or something they heard on the radio just mm. as though and and it it you know all these irrational things we can be our own worst enemy <laughs> it doesn't matter how much we we dig deep into the logical um, aspects of investing or money management we need to be aware of these biases that we have because you know as I just said before we can um, we can be our own worst enemy mm. Mm. And they can filter into everything we do, especially in investing. And I guess if you don't realise them, it can impact your performance and your returns long term. Yeah, there's a line I love, and that is when emotions are high, logic is low. And uh, I think, you know, at the time of recording, it, what is it, mid-June, mm. markets mm. have had a pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty good... Yeah, everyone's pretty happy at yeah, the moment. everyone's pretty happy. <laughs> but um, mm. the, the, I think the behavioural mistakes, you know, start to kick in when mm. people get a bit nervous, they can't sleep at night. Um, all these other like there's a story I've, I've told uh, this a few times recently in the, that um, if a neighbour of yours wins the lottery the chances that you are uh, going to go bankrupt actually significantly increase wow. and that's <laughs> because we are influenced by the um, uh, the money management of people around us yeah. so if someone all of a sudden starts increasing their spending and buying all these other things that's actually going to influence our spending mm -hmm. behavior too and so keeping up with the joneses we start taking on a bit more financial risk <laughs> to try and keep up with them so this doesn't make sense it's the stupidest <laughs> thing ever but this has been proven yeah so mm -hmm. um uh, i guess that's just an example of you know when emotions are high logic is low yeah i guess it's like watching everyone at work go on holidays and then yeah. you're you're perfectly fine before because you're, you're going to go on one next year, but then suddenly you feel like you're the one, odd one out and mm. you're missing out on all this opportunity. Mm. There's um, there's this, uh, this belief in investing in, in markets that there's effectively three types of investing edges that you can have. And the, the, the first one would be an analytical advantage. So you think that people are really intelligent, therefore they would be better investors, which isn't always the case. 
as we know. Uh, the second one might be an informational advantage, and that might be having access to information first or just better information more broadly. But the third one, which I believe overrules everything else, is this behavioural edge. And you and what the, you and the team do at Six Park is, is very interesting in this respect. And I think this is where you personally and as an organisation can add a lot of value beyond just the simple analytics because you've got computers that can do the analytics. You've got the access to the same information everyone else has. So what's your advantage? And I think if you can incorporate the behavioural aspect, how you can teach your clients, I think that's a huge advantage for you. Yeah, you're right. And um, so our investment philosophy um, is quite passive and, and that's mm. just a, uh, probably a bit of a fancy adjective to describe someone that invests in e ETFs and index funds. But where we, we do think it is important is to get diversification right over multiple asset classes and in different countries around the world. And um, that is that is the our investment philosophy. And if you can have some form of dollar cost averaging where you're consistently adding to your portfolio and the ability to stay calm in times of high volatility mm. or even you know corrections or mm. god forbid the the odd crash you know it, it's a fantastic um mindset to have when it comes to your investing and I, I think um you you're so right about um the behavior because i can remember reading about so often some of the portfolios where investors have forgotten that they own them are the best performing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the dead investors yeah. are the best. Mm. Now, I've even heard of, say, once again, bringing it back to Six Park, but having these portfolios for people where you can actually, when they when they go to make a trade or to sell or something like that, you can actually prompt them and say, hey, if you do this, this is the tax outcome. This is the likely, this is likely what you're feeling. And it's simply because the computer can run an algorithm over your, decision making effectively and see what thousands of other people have done before you and then analyze what the expected outcome is and it's it's quite a unique way to tilt on behavioral investing yeah you're exactly right and that's um we don't actually have that that feature to um give people the nudge about the um uh, it'd be pretty clever yeah so like if you make this withdrawal now you're going to be five hundred thousand dollars less off worse yeah, off in the long term yeah, yeah. and it, it's all that um if you're selling at, at a at a gain, it'll probably creating a, a tax event, and that you mm. Um, mm. and if you can make people aware of that, they might think, well, there's actually benefit in just kind of leaving that. that mm. bit. And um, I guess with through technology, um, behavioural economists call it choice architecture. How you can actually implement strategies to ensure that people's behaviour, um, we're not you know we're nudging to them for the right reason, not for the wrong mm. reason mm. to try and do the right thing. And, and that is um, a nudge to maybe um, set up an automatic payment plan or a nudge to remind people that um, their actions here might create a, an unnecessary tax event. And um, I guess that's one of the benefits of technology because yeah. um, uh, before things like APIs and all, and all the, the fantastic technology that we've got right now, it was people on a phone yeah. you know, and you know by themselves and mm. a newspaper trying to work it out. Yeah, having mm. to go for a stockbroker. And yeah, and mm. pay a lot per trade too. Yeah, mm. definitely. Mm. I think my nan still does mm. it that way, has to call mm. someone mm. up and mm. get them to make the trade for her. <laughs> so our, our personal behaviour has a big impact on our financial incomes. I'd like to hear your take on what are some of the biggest mistakes we make. Yeah, well, I, I think I, I study more um, in finance from the investing mm. side as opposed to all the other aspects. And with investing, the conversations that I think I have and probably similar to you is so much about the recency bias. Mm. People really get wrapped up in what has been performing well recently. Yeah. And um, it's probably not so much a story right now, although it has kind of popped its head back up is Bitcoin. And we, we see we you know, how... <laughs> Yep. <laughs> how attracted and people were, how allured they were to these double-digit performance returns, you know, month yeah. after month. And You're getting family that were never interested in finance before and had never invested suddenly asking you yeah. about it. I and think that was the case for most people in the industry. Yeah, mm. so it's be it Bitcoin, be it US tech stocks, be it lithium miners over here. in our Marijuana back. stocks. Yeah, or marijuana, yeah. yeah. And so... There'll always be um, 
the next one of those. And mm. it's just a matter of being aware that uh, no <laughs> one can predict all these things. And, yeah. and mm. um, you know, what the genius does first, the fool does last. So mm. many people will just be trying to chase all these um, recently well-performing stocks mm. and um, probably suffer um, some um, mm. the falls on the downside. The, the other, another mistake is the hindsight bias, which um, I think people falsely put too much importance on their own memory and people assume that their memory events are engraved in their mind and, and mm. they can recall them vividly. But from what the research suggests is that our memory is more like an etch sketch <laughs> where we kind of can manipulate them to be... Yeah, rewrite it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the story a bit better. Yeah, so when people, and this is some of the conversations I've had more recently, think about um, how they may behave in the next correction or crash, well, they'll go, well, you know, I'll, that's I, I learned my mm. mistake in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis there, and I'll know that it's a buying opportunity. But what... It, it's so easy to make that form that opinion in yeah. hindsight, you know, mm. and, and um, but in the heat of the moment, um, we become a bit more irrational. Mm. Um, I guess confirmation bias is not something that's only limited to investing, but that is a, a mistake people get where they form an opinion about something, and that might be that um, they're a great stock picker <laughs> uh, or that. Um, this is a, an investment that needs to be made, whatever it is. And confirmation bias, it's, it's very hard to sidestep. All they'll do is they'll look for all the evidence to support that that is a good decision and, and um, really discount anything that, mm. that um, differs from that. So, and I think we saw it a bit in politics and, and all these other parts of life and mm. I'm probably guilty of it sometimes with my... Uh, discussions at home with uh, my <laughs> wife um, but um uh the, the last the last thing which i want to touch on is a common mistake that that people can make and it it is the it's described as the ostrich effect and it's when kind of a bit the head in the sand approach when <laughs> many people have that approach to their superannuation where or it's all too hard mm. things haven't worked out i'm just going to forget about it and What's fantastic about your podcast and, and this engagement of the, I'm sure listeners have is the earlier you can be engaged, educate yourself. You don't have to get everything mm. always right, but if you can really get some big things right um, and start as early as you can to harness the power of compound returns, you give yourself such an advantage in later in life because this this lack of engagement that some people have, it may not seem like a mistake, but mm. before you know it, a decade can go by. Yeah. And mm. if you go, but I know that we had the financial crisis in 2008, nine, you know, that's 10 years ago. And a decision that could have been made 10 years ago to, I don't know, maybe just ensure that they were invested in the right super fund or mm. maybe just to get a second opinion on some of the fees that they're paying. That can have huge returns yeah. over compounding out over ten years. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting because it's kind of the behavior gap, and we'll put a, show, a picture in the show notes of what it is. But it's effectively buy high, sell low, and then repeat until broke. <laughs> and it's uh, it's one of those things like yeah, we, it's not until we have um, twenty twenty hindsight that we can realize that was a mistake. Yep. Uh, so we've kind of moved into this now, but. What are some of the? I guess we've. What are some of the ways that people can combat these things? Do you think? Yeah, so it's a very good question because we are wired the way we're wired to make mm. decisions, mm. and all investing fundamentally is is the decisions that we make with our own money. Yeah. So um, we need to be aware of the biases and how we make decisions, but also aware that that'll only get us so far. So um. I think if I could provide some tips, um, I, th I think um, we need to protect ourselves from ourselves by <laughs> where possible, and this is, this is far easier said than done, but by decreasing the amount of our own touch points we have with money. and <laughs> Especially uh, with our phone and our yeah, apps. Yeah, because um, 
uh, we will be influenced um, very quickly. Um, some listeners may be aware, but we make decisions two ways. Um, there's the system one way of thinking, which is quite automated. It's very quick. It's very responsive. It's been fa- fantastic to ensure that we survive. And that's how most decisions are made. Mm. System two is a bit more slow, a bit more reflective. It takes more time and more energy. Um, and we don't always use system two, even though that mm-hmm. we think we're very rational and we always consider all items. So um, I think um, being aware of that system one and that, that it's this instinctive decision and what can affect that, we need to, I guess, really reduce that opportunity for our gut instincts and mm. things like that to kick in and decide all of a sudden we need a jet ski, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, and we, we need to buy some more skis or something like mm. that. So um, by automating these things, be it setting up payment plans to ensure that your part of your salary gets paid into something that you can't touch on a Saturday night or um, ensuring that you're putting aside a bit of money uh, into a uh, an investment portfolio, be it Six Park or someone else, this is fantastic. Behavioural economists call it choice architecture. And uh, I, I think um, um, that that can be great. I think, you know, so much of what I talk about is investing. Um, I think you, you really need to make a decision as to your own investment philosophy. Mm. Are you going to be passive, look at the evidence and set up some rules to to be your investment philosophy or if you do think that you're a, you can be a good stock picker um are you prepared to do the due diligence are you prepared to acknowledge what is inside and outside of your circle of competence do pre-mortems post-mortems you know and actually not try and be everything mm. because um i think i see that so commonly with some investors that are pretty they're smart people mm. and you know they'll they'll invest in Australian banks they'll invest in miners overseas they'll invest in tech stocks in the US they'll invest in up and coming companies in China and India they'll invest, and it is very hard <laughs> you end up to, with to a very the complicated the, yeah, portfolio com- complicated portfolio where on the other side of the trade you've got professionals so um i i guess that's the last point that i'd like to make how can you um um, protect yourself from yourself and that is what is inside your circle of competence and what is outside because uh, mm. some people um, may think that they've got a very large circle of competence. I think <laughs> Howard Marks talks about it's not how big your circle is but actually knowing what is inside and what is outside. And mm. For most people that are busy, that have may have a family, they work full time, um, they, get, they catch up with friends and family on the weekend, it is very hard to think that you know something that most professionals don't know on the yeah. other side of the trade when it's be it about Woolworths and West Farmers or a bank or you know. So um, I probably rambled on a bit there, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I, to, to go back, I, I think um, um, how we can automate so much of these these small decisions we can make with our money can really uh, grow to be big things. Mm. Reducing uh, the options you have mm, when it yeah. comes to decision making, I definitely found that automating parts of my finances has actually really helped. And suddenly you look after two years and your investment has grown a lot more than you thought it did because <laughs> yeah. it's just those small regular drips in and it, you don't feel the pain of a small amount going every month. But if you had to, if I had to come up with that amount now, that would be a bit more challenging. And there's some fantastic apps out there that are, to, are probably free to be honest mm. too, where you, you can kind of give you a bit of a guidance. And, um, yeah. and like, like you said, Kate, you get a bit of success and you get that momentum of success mm. and you go, well, I'm actually achieving things here. And, and mm. um, you can, you're right to feel quite proud of yourself too. Yeah. I think we spoke in our podcast last week about using those um, micro-investing apps to sort of learn the basics and learn portfolio construction and diversification so you can start, you can actually use their information for your own purposes mm. and actually get as much value as you can out of it. I do think one challenge, though, with all the apps is it's so easy to withdraw or sell based on something you've seen in the media or a feeling you're having. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. And, mm. um, yeah, there's, there's, there's great sides to technology, but at the same time, um, our money is just one or two clicks away. So yeah. um, sometimes it can be good just to, to delete 
delete the apps if you do feel like that um, you're being influenced and that I, I delete my social media apps every now and then too if I feel mm. like I'm just starting to spend a bit too much time mm. on them. Yeah, having your having your social media, having your news apps and having your investing apps all in one place is sometimes a recipe yeah. for disaster. Mm. I think uh, I really like the idea of automating things mm. and I think some of the, particularly the online banks uh, do a really good job of that, making it very simple to set up, say, BPay transactions mm. or direct mm. deposits, Regular whatever. Regular payments. Yes. Yeah, yeah and, um, the Barefoot Investor talks about you know having buckets of money, mm. and if we were thinking about pure economics, one dollar here does we we yeah. all think about every single dollar is exactly the same. But I think mental accounting is a fantastic way to think about your money, mm. and if you can automate payments into each of those buckets, it can help really help. Mm. Yeah, I've heard definitely people that have the one account for going out and one account for bills and they said that's really helped them with their budget. So instead of having to do up a budget, they've kind of just got the bank accounts and automated payments. Mm. And the problem is you just don't want to have uh, too much to make it too easy for yourself as well as overcomplicating it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, A few others that I quite like, and these are very simple things that people can do, is just have a checklist. So do it when you're in a calm state, something that you can write down or you can just check the boxes off. Mm. For example, uh, I have one and I just take it to my wife anytime I'm going to make an investment. And she's my BS filter, of course. Yep. (laughs) So she just takes it and goes, yeah, but you didn't really think about this, so no. Another one, really good one to do is just to give yourself time. So to set a rule, instead of, say, if it's investment or whatever you're going to purchase, give yourself, say, three days. So say if it's a, a material purchase, let's say it's over 500 bucks. Say my rule is that I can't buy anything within three days of making a decision. And you sleep on it a few nights and you might find that you actually don't value those things that you did in the moment because you're trying to avoid that system one thinking that you were referring to. And probably the final thing I'd say is if you are investing is just have, yeah, just I guess uh, some rules around the intraday movements of your investments. So Jason Zweig, who was a, a, a columnist and a fantastic author, um, he had this book when he narrated, I think it was The Intelligent Investor, some anniversary edition. He uh, he had this rule where he wouldn't sell a share, and he mostly he's an index fund investor, but he wouldn't sell a share if it fell more than 5%. And it's just a, such a simple nudge that you don't want to be selling a loser. He would just hold on to it at the end of the day and see what happens the next day. As painful as it is, it's his rule, and he made that, I suppose, before before the fact. And it's just a little behavioural nudge to try and get you away from that system one thinking. Mm. And in addition just to, you know, um, see no evil, do no evil in terms of just automating everything, it can also it can also be good to have those checklists. Mm. Yeah, Jason's like, how, how good is he? Um, mm. a, a checklist is just a, a good name for rules-based investing. Yep. A, a rules is that when it comes to rebalancing, you'll, you'll sell your winners and, and buy more losers to be able to, to get that. I, another... Um, I just remembered then a, a little cheat that some, uh, some person's done for their online trading account is they've got a, a 20 character long detailed password that you can, they cannot remember. And they and don't they, save it in Google. And, they, and, they, and then they hide it in their garage <laughs> yeah. at home. Oh, wow. and it, so if they want to log into their online trading account, it is a bit of effort to yeah. go through. <laughs> and it, it just protects themselves from, from them. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. That's great. Uh, Anything else that you want to ask, Ted? Okay. Oh, I think that's sort of the major major points I wanted to talk about. Mm. It's been great having you onto the podcast today. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's um, it's not every day we get to have someone of your stature come in and, and, and meet with <laughs> us, and just and not only that, just someone that's interested in finance and wants to come in and talk. Melbourne based. It's pretty hard to find <laughs> these days. Well, it's a passion of mine, and, and to equally to to meet fellow podcasters and and have a mm. chat. I, I think. Um, I'm 36. I'm, I'm aware that there's still so much more that I can learn. Mm. Um, podcasting has been fantastic for my education as well. Mm. To be able to, you mentioned Jason Zweig, to, to to listen to his thoughts on the market. But what's great is about what you guys are doing is that so much of the podcast world that's been in, you know, investing in finance, more often than not, is coming out of America. Mm. So, you know, we, we do have a bit of a, a niche here of people that are producing... Um, <laughs> Content without 401k mentions. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that um, it, it's relevant too because, um, you know, 
uh, be it options like Six Park or, or banks or other providers like RASC. Um, they're real options where people can subscribe to newsletters to get um, mm. education. They can find out more as opposed to some of these uh, entities offshore which yeah. just aren't available for, for Australians. Mm. There's a lot more information nowadays for self-directed mm. investors to do it all themselves rather than having to outsource everything to a, a third party and add an extra layer of fees. Mm. So well, as we wrap up, just tell our listeners how they can get in touch with Six Park and find you on social media, etc. Yeah, appreciate that. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to find out more about Six Park, uh, it's sixpark.com.au and it's completely free to take the Six Park Risk Assessment and uh, it's just, uh, it just takes two minutes and uh, you'll get your free investment recommendation there. Um, if you'd like to have a listen to my podcast, uh, it's called The Richards Report. Uh, I produce them. I only produce one a month, unlike you guys. But, uh, so, <laughs> but so, sensible. <laughs> yeah, well, well done to you both for um, putting out one a week because uh, they, they do take up more time than uh, listeners think. So um, um, I'll be coming out with mine uh, next week. Um, You're on Twitter? And or on Twitter, yeah. So uh, <laughs> thanks for the, the, the nudge there. But, yeah, um, loves Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, at Ted Richards 25. Uh, don't look up at Ted Richards. I think that's someone that – no, at – Is the 25 symbolic? Oh, that's my old playing number. But um, oh, okay. I, I, was, I used to have a um, at Richard's Report Twitter handle, but um, that's uh, actually someone that tweets the weather from the top of Falls Creek head through. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I, had nothing, I, so I want to take that. From my podcast, I had to take Richard's underscore report. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll link to all of that in the show notes. Uh, once again, Kate, Ted, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>